Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Get out as quickly as possible. All right. It? I appreciate you, Stephen Kotler, today's guest on the Into the Impossible podcast. Appropriate because his awesome new book is The Art of the Impossible. And we're going to talk about so many things in an impossibly short amount of time. Stephen, you're a Cleveland boy, just like me. At least I went to college at Case Western, where it was discovered that the universe does not need an ether, a supporting medium to propagate light waves. And it was thought to be impossible for millennia for light to travel through a vacuum without some kind of underlying medium. What do you make of the fact that there are these paradigms that need to be overthrown in order for our perceptions of reality to be shaken towards a common good, that we have to break through and really do the impossible. And there's so much resistance to it, even though on the other side lies truth, lies true reality. Why are humans so resistant to achieving the art of the impossible? So I don't know if I have the answer exactly to that question. That's a hard question. Um, I wanna back off on that. What I, here's, here's, here's what I can tell you. You know, 30 years of studying those, the, the right, the, this has been my beat as, as a journalist, as an author, as, as a peak performance researcher, those moments in time when the impossible became possible. And after 30 years of doing this work, two things seem overwhelmingly clear. One is that we're all capable of so much more than we know. Two is that, and this is the key point, human capability is invisible. Human potential is invisible, especially to ourselves. And it's invisible to ourselves for a, a lot of like, you know, really clear, well understood reasons at this point. For example, uh, potential is an emergent property. We only can find out what we're capable of by using our skills to the utmost again and again and again over long stretches of time. And human development happens in like fits and starts, right? It's like punctuated equilibrium. So we can have long plateaus where it doesn't feel like anything is going on and then sudden bursts, blah, blah. So that's part of the problem. Another portion of the problem is, and this is not my research, Adam Grant's contributed to it, a bunch of other people have worked on it, but you don't know, we don't know what we're going to be good at and what we're going to like until after we've done it, not before. And to the point of, if you, if I were to tell LeBron James and said, Bron, let's say LeBron has never played badminton before, right? I don't know if he has, but he's, let's say he's never played badminton before. I say, Bron, you want to play badminton? Do you think you'll be good at it? Do you think you'll like it? This is one of the greatest athletes on the planet currently. And the research says he won't know if he'll like a physical, another physical skill that's like adjacent to basketball or if he'll be any good at it until he tries it. Like we really don't know what we're capable of. On top of that, we have all kinds of built in time horizons in the brain and limitation horizons that actually shape perspective a bit. So it's a complicated answer, but there's a lot of biology there. Um, and, uh, development is sort of stacked this way. This is a principle in science known as the banister effect. You have to believe the impossible is possible before it becomes possible, right? It's because of very tight correlations between physiology and psychology. So there's a lot, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff underneath this question. We could spend an hour on it. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I was going to bring up the banister effect in the cosmic microwave background research that I do. There's this little beach ball behind me. It was discovered in 1965 by Penzias and Wilson. And then immediately after it was discovered, this heroic feat of detecting this radiation pattern, 454 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Immediately afterwards, people verified it. And it was thought to be impossible for literally decades before. And then all of a sudden, there's a slew of uh, confirmations, detections. And that is crucial to the scientific method. What, be, what was thought to be impossible what was impossible is then later has to be replicated in other words it has to be done eminently possible yeah. in order for science to be to be verified right for sure that's true i mean i think that's true anywhere right it um you see it in athletics they talk a lot about in action sports where people are routinely you know doing things that not only like look physically impossible if they go wrong you're going to die Right. So there's the, you don't you got to do the impossible and you got to get it right because there's moral consequences for error. But they, they talk a lot about how the first person through the door has one challenge. Everybody else, they know it's you know, it's not possible. For example, in park skiing. 
right? This is freestyle skiing. Somebody just threw the very first quad. That's four flips. Mm. Um, <clears throat> nobody thought it was possible. And you can literally like you talk to them before it. And then the minute it happened, another banister effect, right? Suddenly 11 other people threw quads in the next like three weeks. This was a feat that we thought was might've been like defied the laws of physics impossible. We didn't actually think you could quite do it kind of stuff. So we see it all over the place. Talk about the different people. We've had one of your uh, collaborators and friends, Peter Diamandis on the show in a past episode about a year ago at the book you guys wrote together, one of the many books you guys have written together. Uh, and talk about the difference in the type of impossible feats that he can you speak about and that he has done and you have done and your friend, Laird Hamilton, is there, a, is there a similarity between those? Oh, types yeah, of impossible? So let me, let me sort of give you an overview of my career, my work with Peter in the frame of the impossible. Cause uh, it's easy. So I have written uh, 14 books. If you ignore the novels, 12 of them, six of them are on technology and six are on peak performance. Why is this the case? My core subject is what does it take to do the impossible, right? Those moments in time. And I've done this in every domain imaginable. Whenever you see the impossible become possible, you tend to see the same two things. You see people learning to harness and leverage disruptive accelerating technology, right? And you see people learning to extend human capability. When these things come together, you get the impossible. People forget Laird is credited with the millennium wave, revolutionizing surfing, showing us how 50 wave, foot waves were possible. What people don't, for, don't remember as much is the wave runner that allowed him to tow into those waves didn't show up until the late 80s. This was a brand new technology, right? Shane McConkey, who I read a lot about in Rise as Superman, who's legendary as maybe the most pioneering action sport athlete in history, is a skier, and he did things that nobody thought was possible. But he also invented a new kind of fat ski that for the first time ever absorbed way more shock. And where did he get the materials? Out of developments in the aerospace industry, which crept into surfing via Southern California connections and then into skiing through the came up the coast into Tahoe. Right. This is like this is just technological development. Suddenly there were whiz bang materials that could make skis that, you know, worked in a variety of conditions. And they revolutionized sport. We don't talk about that much, that much. I do in my book, Rise of Superman, that really looks at this question. But you see, so you got to, if you're really interested in solving this problem, you need to harness both sides, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk about one of these things that, you know, we authors and you've written so many more books than I have, but I know one thing, my publisher wouldn't let me touch the cover of the book. Uh, but uh, I always judge books by their cover. I, I know most people say not to do that, but what else do you have to judge a book by other than the cover and the title? I love the title, the art of the impossible. Talk about the cover. Talk about the subtitle, the P a peak performance primer. Well, so I, I unlike you, I'm a nutbag about my covers. So I demand, and since, I mean, since I started, like I demand, I've designed most of my covers, including that one. Um, I worked very heavily with the designer, though the designer uh, found that image, though it was an image that we actually created the Flow Research Collective originally. Um, the image and why it's important is simply this. When we say peak human performance, what does that mean? What does peak performance mean? What is it, right? We talk about peak performance, you need it for the impossible to achieve the impossible. What is peak performance? Peak performance is nothing more or less than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. And what this book really is, is we've known about, it focuses on cognitive peak performance, but and we, we know about all the different elements. We've heard about focus or grit or motivation or mindfulness or flow. I've written some of these books, right? But what has happened in the past four or five years that, that this book does that I don't think it's been done before is we now know, and this shouldn't be surprising, especially to you, it's a system. Our biology is a system. It's designed to work in a certain way, in a certain order. And if you get the order right, the way it's designed to work, obviously you go farther, faster with a lot less fuss, right? This is not surprising to anybody, um, but it's new. And so that's what this book does. That's those are the science behind it. There was a second half to your question. Oh, peak performance farmer. This is, so the art impossible is this big, huge title with a big promise. And it's, a, it's legit. This is literally lessons learned from people who have accomplished the impossible at 
for all of us to significantly level out of our game. And if we're not going after capital I impossible, that which has never been done, it's a how-to for how to go after small I impossible, that which we believe is impossible for ourselves. That said, science has an anti-hyperbole tradition. They have a tradition of understatement. And this is a neuroscience-based book. I study the neurobiology of peak human performance. And I do this, you know, at the Flow Research Collective. We work in conjunction with scientists at UCLA, at Stanford, at USC, at Imperial College, London. Our team is psychology, PhD psychologists and PhD neuroscientists. And um, that's what we focus on. And in science, especially if you're going to have a great, big, grandiose thing that comes before the colon you better have something like humble and downstated and quiet like i always i try this was so this was an argument in my my marriage for a really long time i grew up in a tradition of action sports where people are literally doing crazy shit so everything's understated and mm-hmm. science where people are exploring possible shit so everything's always understated and that's how we roll in these communities So like my idea of a compliment is there's a famous story about Wolfgang Pauli. Einstein gives this famous lecture, right? And afterwards, everybody in the auditorium, this is in Switzerland, this is after he's won his Nobel, everybody's speechless. The entire room is speechless. And Wolfgang Pauli is 19 years old, arrogant as all get out. And he pops to his feet and goes, you know, what Mr. Einstein said is not so stupid. (laughs) <laughs> and so for me, the height of a compliment is, oh, that that's not so stupid, right? Because Wolfgang Pauli said it. Just, and I, I, I discovered in, in marriage that if you don't know who Wolfgang Pauli is, your wife will get very upset if you say things like, oh, that idea, it's not so stupid, when you mean, oh, that's freaking genius. <laughs> so, uh, But in this case, yeah, in this case, the peak performance, because it is a peak performance project. That's what it is. It's a blueprint. Mm-hmm. It's a yeah. how-to book. And it uses the neurobiology of peak human performance to outline, hey, there are four skill sets, four categories of skill sets you need to perform at your best. If you're interested in possible, you're capitalized, small I, or you just like you want to be a little more productive at work on Monday and maybe for your kids to be a little less annoying, the biology is the same. Right. And there's four categories of that biology. And that's what the book breaks down. And a peak performance primer is my like, first of all, it's my nod to scientists, especially like when the book goes to Europe. Right. (laughs) And like, it's my like, hey, I understand what tradition I'm working in here. I've got my big fancy title because it helps sell it. But I'm also saying, hey, look, I I get there's a side to this story and I need to be, you know, humble also because, you know, the, the real truth, as you know, in science is a peak performance primer for right now, mm-hmm. right? Because five <laughs> years from now, 10 years from now, forget about it. Like, this is why we call it science. It's a living, evolving discussion. And while the principles I'm writing about are foundational biology, our knowledge of how that biology is working is advancing exponentially. So to believe that, like, this is the end all be all, you know, it's the best I think we know as of today. But I think 10 years from now, somebody else is going to, like, you know, eat my lunch for me. <laughs> Well, I want to talk about this small eye versus big eye. And I, I kind of read the title as, as sort of in uh, Audrey Hepburn's language, her famous quote, nothing is impossible. The very word itself says I'm possible, capital I possible, right? So I want to ask you, uh, in the in the context of, of the personal, the application where the capital I and, and the way I took away from the book, you talk about metrics in the in the in the moment and you say, how do I measure progress? How do you know to truly developing this particular habit? We're talking about ferocity in part one. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking just in my putting on my hat of, of developing the micro skills and interviewing on this podcast. And, and I'm going to betray that right now because I'm going to ask a long-winded question. But I've often wondered when I'm giving when I'm doing an interview, how do I know I'm doing a good job? Uh, because you know you don't know until after the fact when it comes out. Maybe the author will promote it. Maybe they won't. Maybe the audience will give it thumbs up. Maybe they won't. <clears throat> maybe they'll share it. Maybe they won't. By the way, please do share it. Please do give it a thumbs up. Uh, but the bottom line is in the moment. How do I know I'm doing a good job? Are there ways that are there tools? Are there tactics that I can know um, and kind of use as metrics to apprise? Am I doing a good job in this particular set of micro skills that we call podcasting or interviewing? So that's. I'm not so, asking you, by the way, to grade how I'm doing. You, yeah, you know, no, no. I mean, that, like, there, there, so that is a massive question. But let me try to just one immediate feedback is crucial for performance, right? And in 
fields where feedback is more delayed, for example, the difference between surgeons and radiologists. Surgeons, immediate feedback. Patient either lives or dies, you know how you did, right? If there's blood in the cavity, the scalpel slipped. <laughs> Foundational rule of surgery, right? Um, radiologists, they look at a radiological scan and maybe six months from now, they figure out was the diagnosis of cancer real or not real? Did the patient live or die? But most of them never find out. This is why, by the way, if you track surgery, medical skills, almost every class of physician skills decline post-medical school, except for surgeons, it's because of real-time feedback. It tells us that in professions where there are, there's in my profession, writing. What, to say that you have a publisher and an editor, at the, it's a lie, right? You know this. Your editors don't edit. They show up twice in a book, read it, and give you overlying notes. That's not like, I have a guy who is on my sell st uh, staff who's my editor yeah. he reads everything i write after i write it twice a week because that's the feedback i need right so you have to and when it comes to podcasting here's something weird because there's a caveat here and this is why i said i could talk forever this is, comes out of educational research into flow quick definition for those of you who don't know what flow is optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and perform our best that's the scientific definition. More specifically, it's any of those moments of rapt attention and total absorption. We get so focused on what we're doing, extra awareness merges, our sense of self diminishes, time passes, strength, we get so sucked in and an hour goes by and we're like, what, what happened, right? And throughout all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. We can go into way more detail later, but that's the quick shorthand for flow. Here's something that we learned from education research. So flow tends to, flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. One of the most important is the challenge skills balance. We get into flow the most, we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge slightly exceeds our skill set. So think about educators, a teacher, you're a high school teacher, you're in flow in front of the class. Why are you in flow? Because you're not just teaching history, you're on the edge of your knowledge, telling about all the cool shit that you discovered, right? That's when teachers in flow. You have now lost every one of your students. So literally there's an overwhelming research that shows in education, if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing, when the teacher's in flow, oftentimes the students are not, and when the students are in flow, teacher's not. So sometimes, right? And the other thing about peak performance that is very tricky, and my answer, my short answer is self-awareness is important, but you also have to figure out where the signals mean. So you need a translation for the signals like the art and boss with something else. I'll give you another example. In peak performance, your emotions don't always mean what you think they mean. So let me give you a simple example. Frustration for most people is a sign that they're moving in the wrong direction. But if you're interested in flow at the front of an end of every flow state, there is a struggle phase. You, it, more and more evidence is pointing to the fact that you may have to trigger the fight response, even for a millisecond to get into flow, right? This is why if you've ever made the classic how to go to the hospital on a mountain bike error of I went out for a flowy bicycle ride, mountain biking is an aggressive sport. If you go out trying to be flowy, you're going to be risk averse. You're going to get bounced from the bike and you're going to end up in the hospital. You have to hack the hill and then you drop into flow it right so and this is the case we know this from science right you you're gonna have to battle the ideas around in your head and I, like for me i always say i if i have if you haven't reversed my position once along the way completely taken everything i thought was right and told me it was wrong i haven't done science right that's not science yet right. science is what happens once i solve something discover it then get overturned and then come back and fix it. Like to me, that's like the game, right? Then I'm like, okay, I can trust this. And now I can trust this. Smart people have beat on this. It's not just me. That's right. That's what Feynman said. Feynman said, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. Because if you just trust the experts, then we would never have gone from Newton to Einstein. But Einstein said, oh, Newton's pretty smart. Let me just rest on Newton. <laughs> it's Well, it's also, you, you hit at this a bunch in the beginning. And it's, you know, whatever we want to talk about, the banister effect or all these big, big things, it's really a subtle thing. It's the reframing is mm -hmm. so, 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 so crucial to um, psychology, to peak performance, to innovation, to creativity. Like it is one of the most powerful cognitive tools we have. Mm -hmm. And it's how paradigm shifts occur.
yeah. right? That's the skill that leads to a paradigm shift, but it's also a skill that allows you to regulate your nervous system very quickly and, you know, see problems from multi-perspectival perspectives. That was not a true word. I think I just made <laughs> that okay. up. I don't know. Neologism. Perspectives. Neologism. What is that? <laughs> Uh, you say in the book, you say not going big is bad for you. What do you mean by that? All right. Uh, I'm going to have to, there's a little bit of background. We've got to cover before I can explain this. So we talked earlier, peak performance is system, getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. So that biology, while vast, is limited. There's a set of motivational skills. There are a set of learning skills. There are creativity skills and there are flow skills. That's the suite. That's a cognitive suite. To think about it easily, just to frame it for people, motivation gets you into the peak performance game. Learning allows you to continue to play. Creativity is how we steer. Flow is how we amplify the results, right? That's the, that's the quick and dirty of the formula. Mode, all of these terms are catch-alls, right? Motivation is not one thing. It's oh, actually it's compression. Good. You're compressing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So motivation is actually extrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivation, goal setting, and grit. We're going to focus, to answer your question, predominantly on intrinsic motivation. What research has showed is there are five major intrinsic motivators, curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And they are literally designed to come online in an order. Curiosity is designed to be cultivated into passion, which is designed to be turned into purpose. Once you know what your purpose is, what do you want? Freedom, the autonomy to pursue your purpose. And once you have the freedom to pursue your purpose, what do you need? Mastery, the skills to pursue it well. So inside of that, all of those uh, autonomy, curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery, they also do double duty as flow triggers. When we're curious about shit, we pay more attention to it. Our attention is more focused on it. We're more likely to get into flow, et cetera, et cetera. So there are eight major causes of depression, right? And the point was we are designed to go big. We have a system. It's designed to help us achieve the impossible. That much is clear. Peak performance is everybody's birthright. And simply put, everybody can get into flow. Flow is how we do peak performance. It's universal. Like anybody anywhere can get into flow. It's task unspecific. It is race unspecific, sex, class, on and on and on. It's ubiquitous in humans, sexually ubiquitous in most mammals and definitely all social mammals. Mm -hmm. Besides the point, um, the point here is we're designed to go big and not going big is bad for us. Why? If you don't use any system the way it's been designed to use, bad things happen. So there are, as I said, eight major causes of anxiety and depression. These are the anxiety and depression, by the way, are the largest epidemic in the world today, right? Like, and, and we are losing not only like one out of 10 people in the world is going to come down with a clinical diagnosis of anxiety or depression in the next year. And somebody kills themselves once every 12 seconds. Yeah. So we're losing the fight and it's the largest drain on public health coffers in the world. So big problem. What are the major causes of depression and anxiety? Two of them are the ones that everybody talks about and everybody thinks about, and they're actually kind of bullshit. We talk about genetics and trauma. I've got the wrong genes. I can't produce serotonin. So I'm depressed or I'm anxious or this really bad thing happened to me and I can't get over it. Right. So I'm depressed and I'm anxious. And it turns out we know really well-established science, depression and anxiety. Genetics is only ever 50 percent of that equation. Lifestyle, history, all that. That's the other half. Right. Mm -hmm. How we live, how we have lived and how we are going to live. That's the other half. And trauma, the vast, 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 vast majority of the time, trauma leads to post-traumatic growth. This is how we like, this is the world breaks everyone. And afterwards, many are stronger at the broken places to quote Hemingway, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, bad shit happens. Mm -hmm. We get through it and we're better for it. This is the vast majority of the time. So what are the other six major causes of depression? If those two aren't all that real. First, most important one, lack of meaningful work. What does that actually mean? What is it technically under the hood neurobiologically? It means work that I'm not curious about, that I'm not passionate about, that is not aligned my purpose or my strengths, that I can't pursue in the way I would want to pursue it so I have no freedom. And it doesn't offer me opportunities for mastery. I'm not getting better at any skills that really matter to me, right? And to boot, it doesn't produce any flow. Second one, lack of meaningful values. Well, what does that mean? That is, 
I don't have passion. I don't have purpose and I don't have flow. And we can literally go on and on and mm -hmm. on to the rest of them. We are designed to go big and not, we are designed to rise to our full, full capability and not trying to rise to our full capability is bad for us. Yes. You talk in the book about uh, flow being also kind of governed by a flywheel that also is intrinsically limited by the scarcity of resources, that resources from physics and even just from common sense are fundamentally intrinsically limited. And I wonder, you know, I, I think about in the book, uh, when I think about science as an infinite game on one hand, like you can't win science uh, on the macro scale. Like you never come to the end of science. You know, science is John Archibald Wheeler, the teacher of Richard Feynman used to say, you know, is a, is a, is a battle to increase the island of knowledge but the ocean of ignorance is infinite. So the coastline gets bigger, but the, and the area of the island gets bigger, but you still have this infinite, <laughs> infinite ocean out there. Uh, so I wanna ask you, you didn't can't win Wheeler science. discover the Schwarzschild radius? Say that one more time. Didn't Wheeler discover the Schwarzschild radius? He was inf influential in many fields. Uh, uh, Schwarzschild himself was a, was a physicist who discovered the solution of the black hole before Einstein did in, uh, in 19- Well, no, the, but the Schwarzschild radius, right, is the, is the, uh, right at the point that everything bends in. And it didn't, I think Wheeler created the equation that governs it. I think Schwarzschild. Wheeler coined the term black hole. Uh, he's he's one of the, uh, the, the the foremost exponents of that. But Schwarzschild was almost 50 years older than, than right. uh, Wheeler. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to your theories on uh, quantum electrodynamics in just a moment, Stephen. Uh, but I do want to ask you, um, in science, we have a series of, of, of finite games in that, you know, I want to win the Nobel Prize. I have only a certain amount of, of chances to get funding. I got to get tenure. I got to support my graduate students. I have a payroll of a million dollars a year. Literally, I make no profit. I have only expenses. I have logistics. I have concrete. I got to deliver to the South Pole or to Chile. Um, I've got all these finite games and I got competition. I could get scooped. I could lose my Nobel Prizes. Maybe I did the title of my book, spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, but the point is, Stephen, we have all these, you know, finite games, scarcity of research. How do you get into a flow state when you're, when you're battling in, the, in an infinite game in a series of finite games? It's, it's very unlike a lot of, uh, of other pursuits like art. You know, no one's going to paint the Mona Lisa, scoop me on the Mona Lisa, uh, which is an infinite game too. You can't win art. So how, what, what advice do you have? Maybe my, that'll be my last question before I get to one final question that I ask all my guests. So how, how do you survive the finite games, uh, the, the competition in the flow state when, when you have these scarcity of resources in the finite games to win the infinite game, if you will, of science? I want to start by saying, I always tell people, and mind you, I work with some of the best athletes in the world. I always say, if you want to see what real competition looks like, go to a neuroscience conference. Like, I was like, you, you don't, like, you've never, like, honest to God, I've said this to professional football players. I'm like, you guys don't know. You have no idea. Like, the worst, most violent, besides a street gang fight, the most violent place I've ever been to are, like, you know, the Society for Neuroscience. Or something. Stephen, there are more people on the ISS Bloods right now floating around in space than there are who won Nobel Prizes in cosmology. Yeah, so, I, I mean, you're asking a question about, I mean, you're asking a very, very difficult question, but the short answer is really about how do you stay in the challenge skills sweet spot? How do you process anxiety, right? And psychology has been really like, this is where uh, really simply the peak performance basics come into play. So science has said, hey, look, if you want to perform at your best in any conditions, especially competitive ones where you, there's going to be extra anxiety, right? And you want to get into flow, anxiety will block flow because that challenge skills sweet spot is pretty thin, too much anxiety will kick you out and then you can't get into flow. So how do, science says there's, look, there's three things you can do to fight anxiety. You can have a daily gratitude practice, a daily mindfulness practice, or do 20 to 40 minutes of regular exercise. And if you're doing it for cognitive, for anxiety, you're basically looking for a nitric oxide release. But how, what does that feel like when your lungs open up and your brain gets quiet? about 20 to 40 minutes into exercise, depending on how in shape you are, there's been a global release of nitric oxide in the, in the brain and the body has pushed the stress storms out of your system. You've reset the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Five minutes of a gratitude practice will do the same thing. And 11 minutes for stress reduction of a meditative focused, mindful respiration practice will do the same thing. What we tell people at the Flow Research Collective under normal conditions, do one a day. 
if you're living in high stress conditions, do two. I would say if you're a scientist, mm -hmm. you might want to think about three. Yes. Right. I really like, I like, I'm not joking. It really, like, I think it's one of the most competitive, difficult arenas to be in and not for everyone. Um, and you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's no joke. Um, you, journalism is another, like, it's the same thing. You can get scooped. It's the same. Like, yeah. so it's this cauldron of like, you've got this artistic creative background. What we're all doing is innovative, creative, but, and craft based in a sense. And what's built on top of it is this incredibly cutthroat cool. competitive cool environment. Oh, yeah. Limited because, resources. I mean, getting into the major leagues is almost impossible, right? And getting into triple a baseball also, as I understand it is almost as, almost as impossible, but getting a postdoc, which is the, the tier analogous to getting into triple a baseball is almost trivial. I, I can do it, you know, <laughs> but, but the point being it's, it's almost a, it's a total seller's market. Almost anybody who wants a postdoc, Stock. I have zero unemployment for any of my students, and they're all great, obviously. But but uh, it's the point being is we set up people in the academic ladder, and these are people who had to fight to get into college against the best and brightest in their high school. Then college, they had to get into graduate school, get graduate school, get a postdoc, postdoc, get a fellowship, fellowship, get a scholarship, and keep going. And, and at at the apex, it's just like those you know competing against these gladiators and the best ones. And then there's no faculty job. Literally in my field, there hasn't been a faculty job in experimental cosmic uh, studies where you build telescopes and put them all around the world or in space in years, Stephen. And we set these people up and it's and it's cruel. What we're doing to these people is cruel. And I feel terrible and I've limited the number. And it's like, you're turning away people that are smarter than I am. And and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's there's something that I think is, is even crueler than in the uh, academic, or sorry, than the athletic realm that you described. I know you're time is so limited. Uh, I could talk to you for hours. Maybe we'll do a part two, Stephen, if you'll indulge me. I do want to ask you at least one of my thrilling three patented questions. I hope people will subscribe. Uh, and I hope that you will also uh, uh, tune into the episode I did with Peter Diamandis, Stephen's friend. Uh, we talked about you as well in that episode. I'll put a link to it here uh, in the uh, in the YouTube uh, link and in the show notes. I want to ask you, um, uh, our Sir Arthur C. Clark, I'm the co-director of the Arthur C. Clark Center for Human Imagination here at UC San Diego. We study creativity, imagination, all the things you talk about, priming one to get into that state in your wonderful new book, The Art of the Impossible, uh, available now. I'll put links in the show notes to buy it. Uh, I want to ask you, Arthur C. Clarke had many delicious, delightful laws, one of which is uh, the, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We opened the show with his voice from beyond the grave. Stephen, you talk about impossible. I got that. That was an impossible get. He reads that, says that wonderful statement. He says also for every expert, Stephen, there's an equal and opposite expert. So beware of that. But his third law will appeal to you as it does to me. The only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. That's the origin of the name of this podcast. I want to ask you, Stephen, for advice to your former self. What mysterious aspect of your life perplexed you as a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, or maybe even younger, but makes sense to you? And what advice would you give to your former self to give you the courage to go into the impossible as you have done? Oh, I don't know. Um, I never think about giving my former self advice because honestly, I like I got exactly where I wanted to go. Right. So I don't want to mess with anything. But if you know, I like I, it's it, that's an interesting question. I um, and somebody else asked me so the, the, the thing that would have been very helpful because it's hard to know this when you're younger is that hard work works or hard, smart work works. Right. And I have spent I'll give you I've, I've spent 20 years asking most everybody I've met a simple question, which is tell me things in your life that happened that really mattered, where they shifted your life and it massively impacted your performance on the other end. You know what I've never heard? Oh, there was this time I got lucky and I found a lottery ticket on the street. Like it's, I had to work three jobs to put myself through night school so I could get into medical school. So like, right, those are the stories we tell. Right. And the truth about peak performance is very, like there's a couple of difficulties with peak performance. One is that human potential is invisible. The other is if you really want to see what you're capable of, it works like compound interest, right? It's a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow. And when five, two years, three years, four years, that's where it gets, starts to get really magnificent. It's exponential um, in its own way. And like 
almost any other exponentials, it's pretty invisible, right? We have a linear bias built into the brain. We don't, we're blind to exponentials as the whole world discovered when COVID happened. And they were like, how can it be spreading so quickly? Well, welcome to exponentials. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's this little thing called math. As you guys talk about in your in your D's and your five D's, which one of which is Diamandas, but you should add a K in there. Stephen Kotler, thank you so much uh, for going into the impossible and sharing the art of the uh, of the impossible. You are impossibly delightful to talk to. I hope you'll come back on the show. We could talk for hours. As I said, uh, we salute you and and uh, really just want to express our gratitude for all you do for the world and the Flow Collective. And we'll put links into all your wonderful material, much of which is free and, and available on the internet. But I do hope people will pick up this book. It's crucial for our times uh, that we're living in. Thank you, Stephen. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Brian. That was really nice of you. Appreciate awesome. you. Take care. Bye, my friend. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you enjoyed this video, I know you'll love my video with Commander David Marquet, who wrote the book Turn the Ship Around and Leadership is Language. And if you love books by Stephen, you'll love his co-author's appearance on Into the Impossible, Peter Diamandis. Click here for that, and don't forget to subscribe.